I was the future once, said David Cameron in his last day in office mm. as Prime Minister. Well, um, as the Spectator's cover piece by Katie Ball says this week, uh, he is the future once again after Rishi Sunak on Monday surprised everyone by bringing back David Cameron as his new Foreign Secretary uh, amid a reshuffle, a bigger reshuffle. Um, I'm joined to discuss this very surprising development with uh, Kate Fall, uh, Baroness Kate Fall, who was uh, David Cameron's uh, advisor uh, for a long period of time, and uh, John Redwood MP. I can't think of two better people to talk about this subject with. Um, Kate, I will start with you. Uh, everyone was surprised. May I ask if you were surprised? Did you have an inkling that this was in the offing? I had an inkling, but only just before uh, right. that um, that um, it was happening. And I think, yeah, I think it was a very commendable um, of Rishi to reach out to to um, a tall poppy in his put a tall poppy in his cabinet. Um, I think David Cameron has the experience and status to be a really great foreign secretary at a time when, you know, the, the world is um, really in a very difficult place with Middle East and Ukraine, rising tensions with China. So, um, yeah, I thought it was a very interesting and good appointment. Uh, there's been a lot of talk this week about, you know, the fact that he's a serious politician, that he brings skills yeah. and experience and so on. Uh, I suppose the fact that the story didn't leak might help uh, add to the fact that uh, that he is a, a, a is a proper politician because um, generally when in the Tory party in the last few years we're not used to um, them being able to keep surprises. It, it, would you describe him as a consummate professional? No, he he absolutely is a consummate professional. Um, he he was very very um, good and very focused on that wider national security role at his time in number 10. People often don't realise that almost 50% of the Prime Minister's time is spent on that sort of wider beef, if you include, you know, Home Office uh, affairs as well. And he's he is passionate about it. It was sort of great and reassuring to see him today, I thought, with Zelensky. I'm sure he'll be turning his attention also to the Middle East. And I think when we look to next year, when you've got all these big elections coming, not least with the USA, a sense of, um, will there be a vacuum in, in in sort of global leadership? The fact that you have David Cameron there on the world stage when Rishi, obviously Prime Minister, does some of that, but he'll be spending quite a lot of time thinking about the general election. So good reassuring, I thought. Well, you say that, Kate, but there are uh, quite a lot of criticisms of David Cameron's foreign policy as Prime Minister and, and perhaps quite a few very valid criticisms. I mean, let's start with uh, Brexit, which obviously went wrong for him in a big way. Uh, you could also point towards Libya, um, where he was very much behind the intervention uh, that ended up being a disaster for the region, possibly creating ISIS or certainly bolstering ISIS. Uh, and then lastly, of course, there is this issue of China, um, where he was very much behind the golden age. Um, and Rishi Sunak's administration appears or appeared to be uh, very different on its positioning with China. And there are some lots of questions about the amount of money that he has taken, um, possibly to shill for China in the last few years. I mean, that's quite, uh, that's three rather big things that um, he can be criticised over on foreign policy. So just dealing with that, I mean, starting with Brexit, look, David Cameron put the question of our membership of the European Union at a point when people were feeling worried about where that was going to the British people. He argued for us to stay. He lost that argument and resigned. So I, I don't think that is um, a failure. I think it's a, it would have been failure if he hadn't put it to the British people. Um, Libya, look, one of the most difficult jobs as a prime minister is that question on your watch, what do you do to save lives? Often there's no perfect solution there's a cost to either thing so that with Libya he went in he was passionately trying to stop a terrible situation with China I think that is you know a very interesting live issue I'm sure John Redwood will have a view on this look at the time when David um, Cameron was prime minister he put forward a, a strong prosperity um, sort of narrative with China but there was always the national security the human rights angle you know the sovereignty issue but also China has changed and um, she was only just in place during that time and look he's moved towards a much more authoritarian um, um, way of running China 
We have terrible things happening in Xinjiang. We have what's going on in Hong Kong. And I think, you know, David Cameron will react to China of now, not to uh, where it was all those years ago. So that would be my, my answer on the foreign policy piece. John, uh, I'll bring you in. Uh, you've seen a lot of reshuffles in your time. What was your reaction to what happened on Monday? I think it was a great pity. Um, I, my advice to prime ministers, which they've always ignored, is not to have general reshuffles. They, they are usually bad news. And I've never known one that suddenly changes the fortunes of the government favourably. Uh, I think we need much more professional management of ministerial talent and MP talent. There needs to be proper talent mapping. There needs to be mentoring and encouraging. Um, ministers need to be given a defined task and it needs to be reviewed on a regular basis by their uh, immediate uh, superior uh, so that you don't get to a point one or two years in where you're standing by your phone not knowing whether you're good, bad or indifferent, whether you're going to be promoted or sacked. I think it's totally unacceptable. Uh, and you create too many people who don't like you as prime minister. It's quite a few of the people who sacked didn't particularly deserve to be sacked. It was just some argument about, oh, you need to open it up to different types of people or something. I think David Cameron was more sceptical than most of our reshuffles, sort of got talked into them. Uh, but this one, I think, um, did backfire badly, uh, as we've seen. Uh, and we now have to get behind the new team to try and get the show back on the road, get people talking about what really matters, which is what work are we doing for the country? How are people's lives going to be better? How are the Conservatives going to stop the small boats, get the economy growing and get inflation down uh, uh, as quickly as possible? Because those are good aims, uh, but they were knocked a bit by the events of the last few days. There is, a, among uh, people in SW1 or Tories in SW1, you do pick up a certain nostalgia for the Cameron years because they came before Brexit and the chaos of Brexit and they came before the pandemic and the disaster of the pandemic. And you do pick up this sense that in the Cameron years, uh, possibly because they're in coalition, uh, the Tory party had uh, more drive, more sense of purpose, more competence. Do you agree with that? No, I don't agree with that formulation. I, I think David's great achievement was to give us the referendum. I agree with Kate on that. It's one of those who wanted a referendum. I was delighted when he saw the wisdom of doing it. I was sad that he backed so strongly the side that I always thought was bound to lose and associated himself with a set of totally bogus and wildly wrong economic forecasts in an effort to say that Britain as an independent country couldn't do well. I thought that was very disappointing. Mm. Uh, and I understand why he resigned. I think now he is our foreign secretary. And I've always found him friendly and easy to get on with. And he, he's a great communicator. He's very able. I think those are all great things in the minister, so I wish him every success. And uh, now he is our foreign secretary, but I think he does need to reassure uh, the half of the country that desperately wanted to leave the EU and wants a government that strongly believes in Brexit and starts using freedoms it's given us, because we're not using many of the freedoms we gain, that we need reassurance <clears throat> from our foreign secretary that his thinking has moved on that he knows he's part of a Brexit government which was elected on that single pledge, really, to get Brexit done. And would he help us get it done properly? Because we're still too tied to some of the EU laws and problems, and there are huge opportunities. And he should, above all, tell people, as I do, uh, that our big win already is that the EU is spending and borrowing on a colossal scale, and the UK would have had um, much bigger demands on, on our money for EU purposes, and we'd have had to guarantee the debts of, of others through the EU borrowings. And isn't it great that we don't have that added complication uh, in a difficult economic situation? Kate, there's a lot of talk about Rishi trying to bring the Tory party back to the centre ground with by bringing Cameron back uh, and possibly sort of uh, pushing himself away from the Tory right. Uh, do you buy that or do you think it's media piffle? I think bringing David Cameron back was really about putting someone really serious in that very important post at this time. I also think there was an element of sort of trusted advisor. I mean, 
There is no doubt that as a leader of a party, especially a prime minister, when you come into an election, there is a bit of sort of loneliness of power. You know, the weight of that falls on your shoulders. You're, 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 you're putting yourself up for election on behalf of your party. I think having someone um, with you there who understands that feeling will be, you know, really, really helpful to Rishi. In terms of the sort of centre-right, I mean, it does look, it, I think people think that because Suella Braverman left as David Cameron came in. So they see those two together. Um, but overall, I think that the, the reshuffle seemed to me to be quite balanced. He brought in Esther McVeigh. He's put in people that he likes and respects. This was his first time. It was much more his cabinet, his government. He inherited really... Um, from Liz and didn't want to fire a whole bunch of people when he came in. So I just think it's a very personal set of appointments. John, what, what do you think about all the talk of uh, Sunak effectively giving up on the red wall, uh, trying to shore up the blue wall with this reshuffle? Well, I don't think that's the right interpretation and it would be a crazy policy because you've got to address both audiences and on some issues, the two audiences are actually united. I mean, they both like some tax cuts and some growth. So that the kind of things I recommend are, are designed to bring the party together around good conservative policies that would improve the economy, improve a lot of British people uh, and would actually be good news in, in both parts. But I don't, I don't think he's cut loose from the Red Wall because his number one um, aim, he keeps on telling us, is to, to stop the small boats. And, and that's much more popular in the Red Wall than it is in the so-called blue wall seats, where more people, more relaxed about numbers of people coming into the country. Mm. Uh, so no, I don't think he's given up on, on that at all. I think what he's got to do, though, um, is to cut loops from some of the extremely bad official advice he's been getting on, on everything from migration to the economy and to inflation, because the, the official advice has been followed too slavishly. And we've ended up with borders are not under control. We've ended up with an inflation rate uh, that was more than five times the Bank of England's target to more than five times the Bank of England's forecast. Uh, and we've ended up with no growth uh, at a time when uh, you can get the economy growing, as we see over the Atlantic, with the United States of America recording 4.9% growth in its most recent figures, despite itself having a bit of a monetary problem and crunch as well. Kate, you mentioned uh, Xi Jinping earlier uh, and his authoritarian turn. Uh, he had a meeting with Joe Biden yesterday, uh, which seems to have gone fairly smoothly, obviously differences of opinion on, on lots of things. And Joe Biden at the end uh, called Xi Jinping a dictator again. Uh, I'd like to ask you, do you think David Cameron thinks that Xi Jinping is a dictator? And how do you, you said earlier that he he's because China has changed, David Cameron's position may have changed a little bit, but he hasn't changed. Cameron hasn't changed much on China, it seems to me, up until very recently. I mean, only three weeks ago, he was in Sri Lanka uh, speaking in support of the Colombo Port Project, which is a big China funded project. Uh, and I, I accept that he wasn't being paid directly by China or anything but for that. But yet it is clearly supporting uh, a Chinese expansionism, which concerns a lot of people. Um, how's he going to handle China? So, I mean, obviously, you, you'll have to ask him um, that. I mean, look, it was interesting to see um, Biden and Xi meeting yesterday. There is a sense that um, everyone in, in the West has become much more uh, scrutinizing of China, especially on the economic front, to calling out um, concerns that they have over human rights, national security, and sovereignty for us in Britain. Obviously, Hong Kong is top of that agenda, um, but the Americans more focused on Taiwan, and, and that's a focus for us too. But there is also the sort of economic prosperity angle to this, and I'm talking about British prosperity. And I think, you know, we want to try and find a balance, don't we, to make sure that we, we scrutinise, but we also make sure that we, you know, do trade with one of the, the biggest economies in the world. And it's, a it's about finding a balance and being, you know, really careful about it. Um, I also got the impression looking at that meeting that, you know, the Americans are trying, you know, to create some sort of they don't want it to get out of hand. When the, the Chinese balloon went up the other day, there was a concern that no one knew who to phone. It wasn't like the old days with the Soviet Union where they had this sort of red phone. So, I mean, there's, there's the most important relationship. And I really hope we get that right. And I think we need to be 
careful, but we need to be addressing British interests at all the time and working with our allies, especially in the G7, which has become a really functional unit um, in terms of trying to get this one right. John, what do you think about that? Do you think uh, the last few years have shown that uh, for the global economy to function for the West, for America, for Britain, uh, China is just uh, something we're going to have to deal with, we're going to have to work with, um, and that people like David Cameron and perhaps to a certain extent Joe Biden uh, have the right approach in being accommodating uh, where they can? Well, I don't think there's any point in, in making an enemy unnecessarily, but you've got to be realistic about China. And I think um, the West uh, has been very unrealistic about China. I think they haven't understood uh, just what a brilliant strategy for China she has developed in order to dominate markets where we no longer have a, a strong presence. I mean, for example, it is the West that is uh, taking their respective economies on, on the road to net zero. China isn't. China is still expanding her CO2 output to the world on quite a big scale and produces 30 times as much as the UK. And yet it is China that has bought up all, all the reserves and technologies and put in the production capacity to make the batteries and the electric cars and the solar panels and the wind turbines that we, we may now have to buy uh, as imports from them. And I think this, this shows that the West was negligent in the way it responded to the, the commercial challenge of China. Um, Kay says we need to protect the trade. Well, there's any problem about protecting the trade because it's more important than export. And China at the moment still wants the, the revenues from selling us things. Um, the issue uh, which the UK has got to define for itself as America is increasingly doing so for herself, is on what terms do you allow Chinese trade? Uh, and we are getting uh, rightly, I think, much more nervous about things that entail technology sharing or gifting or selling technology to the Chinese, uh, given how good they are at exploiting it and how we need basic capabilities uh, and basic productive, productive capacities at home uh, for a whole variety of self-sufficiency and defence reasons. John and Kate, I think we'll end it there, but thank you both very much for joining Spectator TV. Mm -hmm.